Lisa here for a fireside chat on discussing Bloomberg GPT. We have uh, the CEO and co-founder of Stronkel AI, Alex Ratner, as well as the head of machine learning product and research and CTO office at Bloomberg, Gideon Mann. And while they're joining, um, audience members, as you did for the previous talk, I'd encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom um, so that we can, we can take those uh, as well. Welcome, Gideon. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? All good. Amazing. Uh, over to you and Alex then. Thank you. Alex, you're on mute. I'm on mute. Okay. Here, I'm back. Gideon, thank you so much again for, for taking the time to join us and, and for the awesome work that you've been uh, doing in the space. Uh, for those that were um, were here for the, the talk that I just gave, um, had a couple Bloomberg GPT call-outs. Again, I think it's an incredible example. I know your team, by the way, does a lot <laughs> beyond just beyond just Bloomberg GPT, but just, you know, as the, uh, the, the current, um, uh, topic that a lot of us are excited about, you know, it, it's an incredible example. You know, if, if, um, I won't put these words in your mouth, Gideon, but I, I, from my perspective, I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of the models, the algorithms, uh, even the public data that's been used to train models like chat GPT is really, you know, kind of commoditizing out there. And we're seeing that a lot of what intuitively information, theoretically, empirically, Kind of is the most valuable asset is all the kind of private domain specific data and knowledge, uh, and 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 I think just the Bloomberg GBT uh, results are just an incredible example of that. Um, but anyway, let me um, let me jump into some some Q and A. I'm very excited. So uh, number one, you know, how, how does Bloomberg GPT, um, which was purpose built for finance, differ in its training and design from generic large language models? And and you know. What specific? What are the you know key advantages that you see it offers for financial NLP tasks? Well, first, Alex, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to talk to you, talk to your audience. Um, you know, I, I to your point about like data centric AI and your point about commoditization of LLMs. I think um, you know when I look at what's come out of open source and academia um, and all the you know all the people around LLMs, they're there really has been amazing progress in making these models, uh, you know, easier to use, easier to train. Um, I think, you know, I like to think that, you know, one of the contributions of our work was also, you know, being very explicit about like all of the decisions that you have to make. And there are a lot of them. Um, but, you know, what's amazing is the, the, the core architecture, the core design of the language model is the same. It's a transformer architecture. It's this, you know, this deep layer. Um, you know, deeply layered, uh, you know, large decoder only, only language model. Um, there are some like things around the edges that, you know, change a layer norm here or, you know, the gradient clipping. Um, and so we tried to detail all those, but it'll feel very, very, very familiar. Um, but, you know, the, the point that was really different was, you know, to, to your earlier point is, is the training data, you know. So um, as Bloomberg, you know, uh, you know, we as a company do a, a lot of different things. Uh, you know, we, we provide analytics, uh, we have a community, a finance community, and we've collected a lot of data over the years um, in, in news, but also, you know, all together over finance, you know, research, filings, um, a lot of just a lot of documents that were necessary for bringing data to our clients. Um, and so, you know, when we were training this model, we had we had a lot to work with. Um, and so, uh, you know, the basis of the model was uh, a lot of the public data resources. So we used the pile as an example, Wikipedia as another example, great public data resources. And on top of that, we used a lot of our own, uh, own internal data that we had collected for our finance purposes over many years. No, it was awesome. And, and, you know, first I'll just quickly note that when I say commoditization, you know, just like how you said, I, I, you know, I view it as an extremely, I guess I should, you know, alter the word choice sometimes because it's it's an extremely exciting and gratifying. I mean, it's everything that we aim to do, especially on the academic and open source sides and, and on the company side, it kind of lifts everyone's boats. Um, but it, it, it does, you know, speak to kind of wh where where do you get an edge uh, and, and where do you get, you know, significant delta? Is it, you know, tweaking the algorithm or the model? It will be. There, are, There's exciting work that comes out all the time on, on, on that as well. But increasingly, if you're a practitioner, and again, I love the example that 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 you and your team set here. It has to do a lot more with 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 data, and I also love how, uh, as you said, you you went into a lot, a lot of detail about how you made all of those decisions. Because I think a lot of people think about it as, oh yeah, that makes sense that I could do better if I 
do domain specific pre-training. That concept has been around for a long time. I'll just dump in a pile of data that's sitting around my org and it'll work better. And it's obviously, you know, not that simple, right? That's, you know, it, it it's, it's, you know, it, very, very far from that, that case. So uh, you actually went into a lot of detail on all steps of this process in the paper. Actually, if you look at recent announcements about large language models coming out from all sorts of large companies, it, the training data mix and distribution is often one of the pieces that is most kind of is kept most secret. So uh, it speaks to the value, the complexity, the challenge, but it's awesome that, that you guys were able to, uh, to share what you were able to uh, uh, for the community. Um, so I, I think, uh, or just quick, you know, follow on is, I mean, you, you've been a big leader in applying AI. I mean, in general, in the NLP and AI research communities, but also specifically for finance for the last decade or so. Um, what were the biggest check? So obviously you had an org that was very, you know, sophisticated already on the research side, on the operational, uh, oper oper operationalization side. <laughs> um, uh, but what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced when, when uh, taking on this project? Well, I, you know, I think we were, the, the biggest gain is that we had, um, uh, you know, now before this challenge is we had done a lot of work um, before this training in organizing our data internally. Um, and we just spent, we spent a lot of time thinking about, okay, how do we centralize, you know, centralize the management and, you know, improve our data extraction and, and data processing. Um, and so we had really, uh, we really done that um, so that we were well positioned. I think the other thing is that, um, you know, we've done, we've been in the AI game for a long time. And so when we approach this as a challenge and we've been actually doing a lot of NLP um, for, for a long time at Bloomberg. And so when we approach this, the conversation with, uh, you know, I want to say my, my upper management, my senior management was like enthusiastic support of, you know, yeah, we don't totally understand the technology, uh, but if you if you and and all the NLP people feel like this is the direction we should head in, let's do it because that's so central to Bloomberg's business. Um, so you know, from a um, data standpoint and an alignment standpoint, we were really well positioned. I think the um, the hard the hard parts were uh, honestly there is uh, there's a really big amount of research literature out there, and uh, you know there's the amount of work that comes out. Uh, increases all the time from from the time we started the work to the time we ended. There were a few major major pieces that came out that changed the way we thought of it. To give one example, um, to give a, like a, a really weirdly detailed example, um, the numerical precision of the parameter estimates and the gradient estimates during training is very important to the stability of the model. Um, and there was work. Um, I think it was. Uh, I think it was it was Bloom actually that showed that uh, the BF sixteen encoding of the half precision floats during the parameter uh, estimate process as gradients uh, improved the stability as opposed to the FP sixteen uh, precision, um, and so you know and they and they believe that that was very important to their stability, and so you know in the middle of when we're in this process we're like oh wait a minute okay we got to make sure that you know, Amazon that we're working with supports BF-16, you know, half bit, half, half precision floats. Um, so, you know, keeping, you know, both understanding the research literature and kind of like, you know, taking the time to really go through and seeing what all the choices were and what, even what a conservative approach were and was, and then integrating those choices. Um, it, it was just, it was a lot of work. And then at the end of it, you get these configuration choices. Um, that is, you know, once you've set it, set the number right, then you, then you're good. Um, but that part was uh, challenging. And then, you know, we had, we just had a lot of machine learning, deep learning engineers. Um, the the work in training like a BERT model and a, a large language model is very similar. Um, so those that kind of that knowledge transfers, but like at that the skill that you're operating in, they're just unique engineering challenges. But yeah, it's an, I mean it's incredibly fascinating. First plus one to the uh, you know the the, the excitement but 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 you know it's uh, a headache sometimes of just the pace of new literature that's coming out uh yeah. every single day um and uh, uh i mean again it's an incredibly exciting time to be an ai um uh, but yeah it's and i think to your point it's it's 
it's this combination of these kind of quote unquote, what I was calling in the talk that I gave just prior to this, the model centric operations and the data centric operations, again, uh, that, that matter. And I think one of the cool things about the, uh, you know, the, the data centric operations can't really be commoditized when you get down to domain specific data. As you said, you had to put in all that work to curate it. The the wonderful thing about the model centric operations, you still need to go through a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, work there, but they're shared pretty rapidly in the community. So you, it's, it's, it's a challenge, it's a, you know, behemoth challenge in of itself to kind of track them all, but at least they're kind of out there. Whereas maybe kind of getting into my next question, um, you know, you train a 700 billion token corpus, if I got the number right. And, and it was a mixture of finance and general purpose data sets. Like, could we double click a little bit? I know I'm shamelessly focusing on the data given the, you know, the mandate of the conference, but like, that's the part where, uh, you know, imagine you can't just look online. I mean, there are, you know, uh, people share some high level things of here's what we, what splits we used from the, the web pile and from Wikipedia. And we did this mixture, but especially once you bring domain specific data into it, you can't, uh, there's no one that's going to be talking about the right way to mix Bloomberg data together. So how did you think about and approach that challenge? Yeah. Um, Super interesting. I guess just to, you know, to go back to your point about like this model center and data centric, I think one of the surprises for me about from a, a model point of view is there used to be like, um, a, like a tremendous amount of work in thinking about different model architectures. That work kind of doesn't, there's a little bit of work there doesn't really happen. Actually, what's been very interesting in model world is the optimization layer which I love just kind of academically, super interesting, all the optimization level details. But to your point, it's almost like a hollowing out of like the model architecture. There's still work there, but mostly it's on super interesting part. It's like the opti nitty gritty optimization part and the data part. Um, so I guess when it comes to the, um, when it comes to the data piece, I, I guess I just want to, you know, add on to, to your point. I think that one of the other big surprises has been that, um, you know, data was always felt like it was important, but one of the things that these models do is it actually makes all the data that you have that we had much more useful and discoverable. And so the, the value of the data actually goes up um, out of these models, um, which, uh, and so, so to go into kind of the details of how we thought about the split, you know, we, um, we, we split it roughly 50-50. Uh, between public data sources that we had collected um, and kind of our internal resources. Um, out of our internal resources, we, you know, we tried to get everything we could. I think since then, uh, we've discovered a lot more uh, that we can bring in, um, that we're trying to bring in. I don't know if we had any great ways of saying, okay, how much, how many epochs should we spend on Wikipedia data? How many epochs should we spend on uh, financial data? There's a, like a beautiful paper um, I think it's out of, uh, he actually might be, uh, Chris is Chris's name on it, the Do-Re-Mi paper. Um, but it's, yeah, that's, I think I actually mentioned in my talk as well. I think it's, um, not Chris, it's, it's Percy Lee. Oh, it's Percy. Percy. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. his, lab, um, uh, uh, Michael. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, beautiful paper. It has been like super inspiring for us to think about, okay, well, do we actually have the right mix? Do we actually have the right proportions? I mean, the, the weird thing is that um, if you look at the amount of training data that we used, um, our corpus was 700 billion tokens. I think we ended up using around 600 billion tokens of it. Um, but, but if you look at the, the Llama uh, style training, they used 1.5 trillion tokens for a much smaller model. Um, and so I think one of the, one of our takeaways from our work and looking at Llama is, well, actually we, gotta, we should have trained a lot longer um, and we should have, you know, you know, maybe we should have done a few epics. I think they did multiple epics of Wikipedia. So that the other thing that is kind of the intersection of a little bit of the data story and the model story is, you know, because you're you're doing this, uh, you know, stochastic gradient pass. You don't you only see every sentence once in training these big models, which is a little weird. I mean, like in in. When I was a kid, you know, you went, you did multiple passes over your model until it converged. And then you were like, oh, okay, good. We, we know everything now. We have like, uh, we've reached the convex, you know, the, the, you know, the top of the distribution, you know, the top of the, the loss uh, function. You don't have any, there's no real sense of that anymore. And now I'm like tempted to think about it as, oh, what is the sample efficiency for training over this corpus? Have I actually 
wrung out all the information that is available in each sample. And so um, it feels like we're, we are truly just at the beginning of that question. And, and Doremi is like an example of, oh, we actually don't know. Uh, I mean, not, not we Bloomberg, but I don't think the community knows what the right mix is uh, and really how to gain uh, all the value out of the out of the training data and during the optimization step. Yeah, it's super interesting. I mean, just again to 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 uh, like to plus one your point about you know I think a lot of what the challenge in practice is it's it's yeah it's the optimization uh, and the kind of all the engineering aspects of running that process and then it's the data and the model architect. I mean, there's actually a lot of my my uh, uh, co-founder and former advisor over at Stanford just uh, is doing some cool work on new model architectures. Uh, so there's there's awesome, very very fascinating work there. Um, but from a you know from from the standpoint of most of us who are you know building um, you know new model architecture comes out, it's it's kind of out there. And if it starts to dominate, you you plug it in just given the way that infrastructure looks these days. And so you end up still focusing even as there's great model centric or model architecture development process from a, a practitioner standpoint, whether it's as sophisticated as what what you're building or what you know we're trying to build the Snorkel team or you know or or, or more uh, applied, you know that that does kind of hollow out there from from your process, and it is kind of those two two pieces. And then just a, the the part that you were talking about there about you know the data mix having an impact. You know, I mentioned in the last session, but we ran this um. Uh, consortium project uh, via UW, and it was uh, Stability and Lion and Apple and Google, a bunch of others, um, and, and uh, uh, called Data Comp. It's up at datacomp.ai, and it was basically like a contest. If you fix the model architecture, the training script, the algorithm, everything, and you just work on your filtering and sampling of the data, you get a new state of the art score. This was for a clip style model. So the mix of data, or if you're trying to optimize that mix with a Dory Me, uh, you know, or, or, or you know, important sampling kind of approach. It, it, it matters a ton. I also think that's where some of the domain knowledge comes in of, you know, actually applying some of what you know is going to be the, the right mix of tasks. I like the metaphor of, or the comparison a little bit to like database tuning. Like that's a much more mature technology, but when you're doing database tuning, which now people apply machine learning to in cool ways, you're really not trying to find like a right answer. You're trying to, or, or the, there's not like a, a, what you're trying to do is you're trying to tune it for an expected query workload. So I think a lot of what this is going to turn into is like, we're trying to tune the mix of data for these big foundation models for the kind of expected distribution of things we're trying to build on top, which how do you answer that question without having deep knowledge of your organization's objectives and, you know, uh, you know, I was having a conversation, uh, um, I was having a conversation with Kevin Knight yesterday, uh, and he he made the point. He was like, "Yeah, um, people don't believe in evaluation data sets anymore." And I was like, "Oh my God, that's a, that was like it's such an anathema to to, to me as a, as like you know as an academic. It was like, oh, you got to you know create an evaluation test set that mimics what you want to do in practice. Then you got to evaluate against it. And I think." Um, you know, I, I think there's like like a, a a real discussion and conversation around how do you actually evaluate these large models. And one of the I think one of the um, surprising results of of our paper was um, you know that that the training data mix really does make a difference in evaluations, but evaluations in domain, um, and that you know even at the the levels of you know, hundreds of billions of tokens, you're still getting some performance gains in domain. I think that was, I think we we're all hoping for that. That was like a, an outcome that we we're hoping was going to be true, but I don't think that we knew it definitively uh, when we started. Um, and so, you know, I think seeing that, okay, no, no, even at, even at these large, very large training data domains, you can still detect differences in performance um, on in-domain evaluation. And, and that kind of like, that says two things. One, you know, to your point of, well, you got to think about what your domain knowledge is, what your data is that you're feeding into the models. Um, and then the other is you, you have to think carefully, and maybe it's somewhat different about how you think about um, evaluation and how you think about evaluating these models. But that that part of the uh, equation still is hasn't hasn't gone away. There's still some part of, well, what are we using for? How do we know that we're getting the right performance? What's the level of hallucination? How do we, I mean, there, there's just, there's a lot there. 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such an interesting topic around evaluation these days and uh, shameless plug, but I guess just on behalf of this entire community here is that again, surprise, surprise comes back to the data or data centric operations. It's not like a better evaluation algorithm solves it. It's like what mix of data or skills or tasks do you put together? Really actually it's not even data science, it's domain knowledge mixed with data science. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 there's a person at the last talk who asked a question about kind of what, what do you think org structures, how should org structures be built in this new age? And I think, you know, data science ha skills have to be mixed with data skills and with almost kind of domain expert or product management skills, because it is kind of more like a, it's like building a spec for what, what do you want this uh, to be able to do in, in uh, defining the evaluation. And it's, it's really interesting because um, not to go off on too much of a tangent here, but, you know, so much of us, we're raised, you know, so much of what, what we teach and, and, and have been taught as data scientists has been very anchored on, you know, having a, a kind of a black box test set and getting an accuracy score that comes out, right? Like a single score. And I still think that's extremely valuable. I, I still think for the record that a lot of the, the real, and this is actually, this, yeah. we still focus on it at, at Snorkel, yeah. just for the record, a lot of, yeah. you know, we, we certainly for like initial evaluations and projects, we focus on use cases that can be boiled down to a single number because often that's the easiest to evaluate and it's the easiest tied to tie to business value. But as we look like multiple years in the future, I think we're going to start unpacking that black box in a big way and saying, okay, as you know, what we can't just have a single number. We have to have, I think every, every organization, every team is going to have to have their own kind of private benchmarks, kind of think of them like unit tests. And a lot of the AI development game is going to be a lot more about kind of architecting that evaluation benchmark versus the model itself. But then of course they go back and forth because when you shift the benchmark, then you have to shift the data that mix that you're kind of putting into the model. So I think it's fascinating and sorry, last tangent, but it's, it's almost like we've been kind of taught because everyone, everyone in data science knows about, you know, cheating on the test set or test set leakage. So we've been kind of taught, like, don't look at the test set, don't look at the test set, but we have to engineer the test set, even for those models where you're just spitting out a single accuracy number, surprise, surprise, how you engineer the test set matters a ton about whether the model actually works in the real world. So I think we're going to see this kind of unpacking in the black box. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and it'll be super interesting. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's funny. People treat prompt engineer as like a derogatory term. Sometimes they're like, uh, and like they they treat the idea of like a prompt engineer as a joke as like and I, I kind of feel like the the term the term is like um, like kind of undersells actually what the work is in thinking about thinking about constructing prompts and thinking about you know how to interact with these models because I think what would when you're when you're constructing a prompt really you're thinking very carefully about what how what kind of an answer you want what's a good answer what's a bad answer how do you specify you know what that looks like in, in much the same way that as a manager you interact with your teams you know and how you talk to your teams about what you want them to do and how you evaluate your you know all the all the people that you work with you know how or you know and the project so it's like um you know it's almost i almost wonder if like large language model manager would somehow be like more appealing term than prompt engineer because it's a little more of that, a little more of that spirit than, than you know, just like it's not exactly a computer program. And I think that holds for uh, inference time, but also an evaluation. Oh, for sure. I mean, it all comes down to, to your 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 point. It all comes down to this challenge of specifying what exactly do we want the model to do, and and what's the definition of success. And it's worth noting because I was mentioning. Um, you know, I showed a chart uh, from a Google paper in my uh, last talk about kind of, you know, how fine tuning uh, will, will, you know, generally outperform uh, prompting or, or prompt tuning, actually, just something with tuning yep. that it, it really is just a, just to clarify for folks who have suffered through both sessions now, uh, it's, you know, it, it's really a spectrum in our view. It's really just all comes down to specifying what you want the model to do and doing this through a data interface. And if you think about how you do it, you know, um, as a human manager, right? You, you might say, okay, do this, right? And you art articulate, that's kind of the prompt. And then if it's a challenging task, you might give some examples, right? And, and you might have to give a lot of examples if it's a really challenging task before someone is trained to proficiency. Um, so that idea of going from a prompt to a prompt plus some examples to 
a big set of examples, like it's all part of the, and partial of the same thing. Um, and for challenging tasks, you usually to give, need to give kind of more examples, uh, which gets you kind of into fine tuning land. Although increasingly with large context windows, it actually could just be shoved in as a prompt. So this content, this, this, the spectrum of let me just engineer a prompt versus let me label data to fine tune. It's all part of the same spectrum of, you know, based on the difficulty of your task, very cleanly specifying what you want it to do. And to your point, uh, that's both at the input time, but it's also on the evaluation side. And so I think, yeah, this, this kind of product management notion of what do you need to be good at for, for building these broad organizational models is, is super, super relevant. Um, I see we have two minutes left. I mean, I guess the, the, the generic, but, but question I'm, I'm, I bet myself and many others most curious about like, you know, what are, um, what do you think is ahead in terms of building off of not just Bloomberg GPT at Bloomberg, but just domain specific large language models? You know, uh, I think it, it feels like the big, the big question, it feels like there, there are two big questions that are, are, are like being discussed and played out around LLMs, I think one is like, what is the, you know, well, I, I don't think the models are, are creative. I think they're synthetic or syncretive. Um, and so what is, how does the human creative process play into these models? I think that's just, a, these are like, you know, not, not six months. These are like five, 10 year kinds of things. But I think, you know, figuring out what the, the data in, you know, what are the, they're, they're, these models don't do everything that people do. There are a lot of things they do badly. True creativity is like one example. Um, and so I think there has to be a new way of creating those insights and developing them and somehow interacting with LLMs around them. Um, and I don't think it's not exactly, it feels like the old way of doing it, which is like write a research paper or a book and somehow feeding that as training or as context, it feels very slow. Um, so maybe there's a faster way to, you know, as you have a new idea or exploring a new idea, getting it into, you know, the this uh, raw, the gristle that the model can operate on, that's one. And the other is, um, I think uh, programming, I don't think programming is going away. Um, I think it's, it's always gonna be around, you know, I think the need to be super pedantic about what exactly you want, um, and what you want on a, on a hardware level in order to achieve computational efficiency. I don't think that's going away, but I think tr the process of software creation, I know this isn't exactly a, you know, the topic of the panel, but like process of software creation is going to be vastly changed um, and, and expanded uh, in really wonderful ways that, uh, you know, that will be transformative and, and super exciting. So those, I think like, those are the two, um, like, when I think about like what's next as as broad themes, I know that wasn't exactly your answer, but like as as broad themes, those are those are themes that I'm super excited about. That's awesome. I mean, us too. But Gideon, I know we're at time now. Thank you so much for the the awesome discussion and for taking the time today, and and for all the great work that that you and the team are doing. Obviously, both for you know uh, providing awesome capabilities at Bloomberg, but also just for showing sharing so much of your learnings and and showing uh, such a, an awesome example of what can be done with the power of you know latest state-of-the-art techniques and, and awesome teams that can build it with that, but also domain-specific data knowledge and really leveraging it in exciting ways. So um, plus all the other thoughts too, we're awesome. So thank you so much, Gideon. Thank uh, you.